Shalom. Shalom, everybody. It's uh, February the 7th, 2022. We're talking about Parshat Tetzaveh. I'm just going to mute uh, uh, if, if that's okay. Parshat Tetzaveh carries on into the theme, the themes of the tabernacle. If you recall last week, we made a very uh, broad thesis that the tabernacle is a representation of Mount Sinai. And uh, if you can construct in your own imaginations uh, a very easy uh, schematic drawing, which would be the mountain composed of three different ranges, three different zones, and the tabernacle, three parallel zones. So you have the base of the mountain, that's the zone of the people, the midsection of the mountain, that's the zone of the Kohanim and also the elders, and the top of the mountain, the, the zone is restricted for uh, Moses and the high priest in the, in the tabernacle. And so what you effectively get in the sanctuary and its representation is a narrative. And we, we spent some time, I think, creatively looking at how uh, walking through a sanctuary and walking through any kind of sacred architecture delivers, I think, a very important narrative. So it's on that idea of what is the narrative that I want to look at some of the more um, uh, arcane ideas or arcane items of the of the tabernacle and specifically focusing on the vestments of the high priest um, and specifically then focusing on the Urim V'tumim, what, what is being, what's going on there. I'll start by saying uh, in defense, nobody knows, okay? And even the medieval commentators were trying to explain this. And we, while we do have a number of very, very thoughtful, intelligent scholars who are, are attempting, they, they all, I think, to their credit, uh, admit to their humility, which is we, we don't know. We can invent, and that's what we're going to do today. We'll, 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 I, I, will, I will offer some of my own uh, inventive interpretations in the course of this. So hold off on, on, on sharing any of your thoughts on this until we get to the, the discussion portion of this. I'm going to go now into the, um, into the text. Okay, the text is uh, from chapter 28, uh, verse, uh, verses 1 or so, 28 verse 1 to 30, okay? So I'm not going to take time to really do the exploration of, of the text, um, in, in, in depth, I put the, the, the parallel Hebrew and English. I'm going to read it mostly in English. And when I need to make references to the Hebrew, I'm just going to go over to the Hebrew. Okay. So chapter 28 verses one through 30, you shall bring forward your brother Aaron, God talking to Moses with his sons from among the Israelites to serve me as priests, Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, Elazar, and Itamar, the sons of Aaron. Make sacral vestments, vasita vigde kodesh. Okay, so clothing that will function in the sacred realm, vigde kodesh, which I would, he calls it sacral vestments here. I would be a little more precise and say clothing worn in the, to be worn in the holy area for Aaron, for lechavod lutifar, uh, for dignity and adornment. And we had a whole discussion last year on that phrase. I love, it's such a, such a remarkable, remarkable phrase, and it's part of the soul of the Jewish people, and it's expressed in modern Israel, specifically at the Yom Atzmud ceremonies. L'chavod, l'chavod medinat, a lot help me, l'chavod, l'chavod u'letiferet medinat Israel. Beautiful, beautiful. It's, it makes you emotional. Okay, next. You shall instruct all who are skillful, whom I have endowed with a gift of skill. This is also a very, you know, uh, valuable um, verse here. Mileti v'ruach hama, people who are smart, people who are wise. Vasuot big deko. So the people that have, are skilled craftspeople, they they are going to be doing this, and that's pretty obvious that people who are talented in that area to do. These are the vestments they are to make, and we get the whole catalog now. Choshen uh, ve'efod umi'il, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a fringed tunic, a headdress, and a sash. They shall make those sacral vestments for your brother Aaron and his sons for a priestly service to me. They shall therefore receive the gold, the blue, the purple, the crimson yarns, and the fine linen. 
So all of these are the, the uh, raw materials for the fabrication. When you think about them as raw materials, of course, each one of these items is, uh, you know, has to be processed. You, don't, you just can't take raw gold. You have to have an ingot. You have to have, you just can't take raw blue, etc. But so these are the materials that are on their, you know, craft bench. They shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and a fine twisted linen worked into designs. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached. They shall be attached at its two ends. And the decorated band that is upon it shall be made like it, of one piece with it, of gold, of blue, of purple, crimson yarns, of fine twisted linen. You know, as I, as I, be, as I read this, we also have to kind of just put a footnote here to this is the difficulty of the textual conveyance of visual information. So hard to do this, so hard to describe the, these objects in, in words. Um, you know, it would have been better had we had, of course, pictures of it, but you can't transmit, it's so, so complicated to transmit this uh, in, a, in a visual way. There are, scribes have much more ability to pen words than they do to write, to, to, to draw the pictures. And, and therefore, uh, all of the questions relating to what these things look like are based on uh, the canons of interpretation of these texts, which is the, the very, very difficult. Okay, then take two lazuli stones, engrave them on the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the one stone, six of the names, the remaining six on the other stone in order of their birth. So basically the Kohen Gadol is wearing shoulder pads. He's got one, one set of, st one stone on, on one side and another stone on the other side, six names of Israel's tribes on one and six on the other in the order of their birth. On the two stones, you shall make a seal engravings, the work of a lapidary of the names of the sons of Israel. So seals is a very, very interesting thing. It means that it might have been opposite, okay? Like inverse. Having boarded them with frames of gold, attach the two stones to the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones for the re remembrance of the Israelite people whose names Aaron shall carry upon his two shoulder pieces for remembrance before the Lord. Then make frames of gold and two chains of pure gold Braid these like corded work and fasten these corded chains to the frames. You shall make a breastplate, best piece of decision. Choshen mishpat, I think it is. Vasita choshen mishpat. Worked into a design. Make it in the style of an ephod. Make it of gold, of blue, purple, and crimson yarns. And a fine twisted linen. It shall be square and doubled, a span in length and a span in width. Set in it mounted stones. And here, this is going to get interesting. Umileta vo miluat even. Set in it mounted stones. The first row shall be a row of carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald. Abarat, arbaat turim aven. Four rows of stones. Tur odem pitada uvareket. I don't have it lined up here properly. Carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald. Hatura Echad, the first uh, uh, row. I'm going to just do this to it's easier. About Turasheni, Nofech Sapir Vayalom, the second row, turquoise, sapphire, and amethyst. The third row, Batura Shlishi, Leshem Shivo Vachlama, the third row, jacinth, and a gate, and a crystal. Batura Revi, Tarshish Vishoam. The uh, and the fourth, uh, sorry, the fourth row, row, a barrel, a lapis lazuli, and a jasper. They shall be framed with gold in their mountings. Okay, so I'm going to just stop here for a second. Yeah. Okay, and I just, you know, I, I, Ellie Ehrlich, I, I, I have to make this remark. I'm just going to stop the share for a second and say, you know, whenever Jonathan reads this, you know, he reads it very lusciously, and we we end up having a conversation. You know, usually about about the the kind of the 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 words are are so gorgeous. Okay, the 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 words for all of these different gemstones are themselves a kind of poetic manifestation of of the thing itself. Uh, they're they're unusual words. Probably most of them don't occur anywhere else in the Tanakh. Okay, and except for in these passages, there's this. Uh, passage here in chapter 28 and later passage in in uh, 36 i think it is 
plus or minus, uh, where it's repeated. In other words, um, there, you know, for, for, for us who are involved in the text, there's a certain joy even in saying the words. The words are poetic because they're, they're so rare, and, and that's part of the joy of, of chanting them. Okay, back to the, the text here. So you, when you talk to Jonathan, tell me you mentioned, mentioned it. We, I shall we, do that. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So then, uh, the, the stones, 21, the stones shall correspond in number to the names of the sons of Israel. 12 corresponding to their names. They shall be engraved like seals, each with its name for the 12 tribes. Okay? So, On the breast we make braided chains of corded work and pure gold, make two rings of gold on the breast piece, and fasten the two rings at the two ends of the breast piece, attaching the two golden cords to the two rings at the end of the breast piece, then fasten the two ends of the cords to the two frames, and and I'm lost already. Okay, it's very very complicated, very complicated. But but here you know we'll just end it up. The breast piece shall be held in place by a cord of blue, betil techelet, biftil techelet, which we have as a reminder on the tzitzit. So the tzitzit is linked to the vestments of the Kohen Gadol and also the vestment of the, his headpiece, which is not mentioned in this passage, it's a different passage, but, but the, the, the meaning then of tzitzit is then pretty much obvious that a, 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 an Israelite wears tzitzit with its cord of blue to connect him to the, uh, to the priest, to the high priest, and to the priestly vestment. And just as the high priest is holy to God, so on your clothing you wear a cord of blue that reminds you that you too are holy to God. Okay? Uh, Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel on the breastpiece of decision over his heart when he enters the sanctuary for remembrance before the Lord at all times. Inside the breastpiece of decision, you shall place the Urim and Tumim so that they are over Aaron's heart when he comes before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall carry the instrument of decision before the Israelites over his heart before the Lord at all times. So uh, I'm just going to read the last uh, two verses uh, in Hebrew. So it's worn over his heart. When he comes into the sacred area, so as a remembrance to God. And he shall place inside this, this uh, vestment, this uh, 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 the, the piece of decision, the array, array of stones called Urim and Tumim, Vayu alev Aaron. It will be on his heart. Bevo'o lifnei Hashem. When he comes before God. And asa Aaron and Ishpat b'nei Yisrael alibo. And he will carry the the judgment of b'nei Yisrael on his heart. Lifnei Aaron Tamid. So if I were doing a different kind of class today, I would I would focus on. I mean that that's really what drew me to this. Is it? Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting the way this text in its two verses repeats the phrase alibo alibo alev alibo alev alibo which means on your heart on your heart on your heart and and that ought to kind of be the ding 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 hint of what's going on here that the the high priest is wearing a certain item on his heart okay and and you can't get much closer to that and you can't get more intimate and you can't get more personal in terms of you know how something is going to mean something and of course to have it on your heart you know we 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 use that phrase al levavecha to to convey the essential right it's in the shema these things which i tell you today shall be on your heart okay so 
Isn't it remarkable? I mean, I get it, it's it's mitzabrer. This is you know it's very moving to even think of the idea that. Uh, the Kohen Gadol is wearing the names of the children of Israel on his heart. So the simplest, the simplest explanation of what this is, is that he's a walking symbol of the people of Israel. Okay, and so the the um, the narrative that's going on in this specific instance is uh, the the sanctuary is the covenantal representation of Mount Sinai. Okay, a, a portable Sinai in all of its zones. And the Kohen Gadol is the delegate representation ambassador of the people. Okay, and so uh, in on his body are the names of Israel. How else would he make a representation to God of the whole people, right? And, and uh, you know, in the absence of uh, photography, in the absence of, you know, uh, highly developed statuary, which we wouldn't even do anyway, and the absence of, um, well, you, you do have writing, and this is, of course, writing. So the fact that it's done with all of these precious stones uh, kind of opens us up to an imaginative universe where somehow the stones represent something and what is it that they represent is subject to a kind of um, imaginative and even, and I would say here, uh, mystical leap, right, Bob? This, this, this would be, you know, a, a step into, I'm going to say, normal mysticism, which is to say that the thing that's in front of you represents something that transcends it. What that is, we have to we have to figure out. Okay, so I want to just you know give you a, a, some other pictures of this and and show you you know how this has been now represented in in some of the current publications. Um, so here here and I, I may have shown you this before. This is the the front and the back. Fronts on the right. The backs on the left of the Kohen Gadol. I want you to notice the, the headdress of the Kohen Gadol. All right, so um, it's gonna bump up a little bit. Here, there's a gold band, okay? The gold band it says, and you probably can't see it closely on your screen, but there is an engraving in the gold, which is Kodesh Ladonai. Now, I can tell you right at the beginning that this is wrong because it wouldn't have been written in that script. The script that you have there is a later script of Hebrew, the Assyrian script. It's called in the technical language, Kitav Ashuri. And there is something called Kitav Ivri. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, you'll see that, that in some of the scrolls, there is writing in a kind of, um, a, a, in a different Hebrew script. Uh, and uh, I know we've done some, some you know, uh, dipping into that, in previous lessons. Uh, so it's quite likely, you know, certainly in this period, they, they did not use the Assyrian script. They would have used the Paleo Hebrew script, Paleo, P-A-L-E-O Hebrew script, and it would have been something totally different on the band. Nevertheless, it's, it's certainly, it's, you know, don't use this at home. This is for depiction purposes only, okay? <laughs> Uh, notice that there's a blue cord on his headdress, okay? So he's wearing, this is the back, and he's got something on, you know, tied in a knot on the back, and he's got something on the top. So uh, this is a very short leap to tefillin, tefillin, which is not a, uh, a headdress, but, but I, you know, I, I don't have to get, I don't have to get a license in homiletics to, to, to make a kind of uh, simile between uh, the Kohen Gadol's headdress and the knot that we find currently in, in a tefillin. Notice the, the vestments, the ephod. Uh, this is his back, um, and, and it's woven in red uh, that's crimson and purple and white, tchelet bargaman. So there's this blue red weave, okay? And here on the front of this uh, individual are his vestments, and we see. He's got four blue cords on the side, and that, of course, worn by Jews to this very day as tzitzit. 
So the, 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 again, the wearer of tzitzit is uh, linking uh, himself and today herself with the, uh, the vestments of the Kohen Gadol. And notice the beautiful array of stones in all the different colors. And I'm just going to give you a kind of uh, a little zo zoom in on this. Where is that? Here it is. All right. So I just zoomed in on this, and I really don't don't I don't I don't have this lined up. It would be Odem Bareket. I don't know if they're going to right to left or left to right. Okay. But you can see that he's got twelve gemstones on his breastplate, and they are supposed to be engraved. <laughs> Uh, polished and engraved with the names of the different uh, mm -hmm. tribes. So uh, effectively, it's going to be Ruven, Levi, Shimon, Yuda, etc., and all of the others. Um, and they they were there. How this worked is a big question. I'll, I'll share you uh, some discussion of that in a second. Okay. But I want to start with this uh, this little uh, note by Eben Ezra, who says. When it comes to identifying the gemstones, we all grope at the wall as if blind. Okay? Uh, uh, it's a, a quote from uh, Isaiah. And, but then he says, Va'emet shalo nuchal We will never really know what these are. So Ibn Ezra, in writing in the 12th century, kind of conveys his humility, notwithstanding the fact that he himself tries and he lists other people in his commentary that try to identify what they are. But, but there is a tradition, the tradition in, in commentary that, that uh, because uh, Onkelos, the Aramaic translator of the Torah, actually has some uh, uh, cogent translations of these minerals or these gemstones, so they whenever the attempt has been made by commentators to identify the gemstones, they, they first uh, rely on uh, Unclus, and that's how I think the Koran uh, uh, book Bible now has tried to do this. And so here I'm going to uh, try and identify them with uh, what Koran says. So we're going to take a few of them. I have all 12 listed here, but these are the minerals, and you can see, I'm, I'm just going to try and enlarge it as much as it lets me here, and then I'll, I'll read the, the passages here. So you have, they, they identify Odem, uh, Unclus, as some Khan, and that it's carnelian. This is a quartz stone of the silica mineral Chalcedony, impurities of iron oxide color it brown, orange, red. Chemically, it is silicon dioxide. As this is the first stone mentioned, it appears that it was more important and popular than any other precious stones in the biblical era. Indeed, this is the most commonly found stone in archaeological sites throughout the years. So that's a, a fascinating little piece of information that it's a, it's a, a very popular uh, uh, gemstone. Uh, and it's, the red color is because of an iron, of the presence of iron in the mineral. Okay, let's do olivine. Uh, this stone, one type of which is known as peridot, is magnesium iron silicate. Uh, this is identified with the Greek topazion or topaz. It is possible that this is a transposition of the Hebrew. This stone became very common from the Hellenistic era onward, imported from an island in the Red Sea coast of Ethiopia. Thus, it is the pitada of Kush. So already, you know, I'm getting the feeling that this is, it's not that it's going off into, into orbit, but um, it's the, the point is that, that there may have been some kind of currency in these stones in antiquity. Who knows? Who knows where, where they would have gotten these things and how they got them, etc. cetera. And, and, and again, whether or not this in fact was what we're talking about, but it's based on an ancient tradition, pitada as yarkan, yarkan with the word yarek in it. And so they're looking for a greenish mineral and, and the mineral has this type of formula with it. Let's look at bareket. Bareket is a garnet. Barak, a lightning bolt or, or, or flash, apparently in reference to the carbuncle as described in ancient sources. Uh, it's also identified with a red garnet or purplish almondine. 
and it's a, a, a ferrous aluminum silicate, right? I'm, I hope I'm getting that right. And then emerald, nofech, sometimes mentioned in ancient Greek sources as a general term for green precious stones. In the Roman era in particular, it is used as a name for what we now refer to as emerald, mineral composed of beryllium aluminum cyclosilicate with the chemical formula of Ba, etc., with trace elements of chromium, vanadium, giving it its green color. Uh, lapis lazuli, the meaning of the Targum word Shavi is unclear. We believe that it refers to blue lazurite, which sparkles with gold. And you've seen this, this blue uh, in, in, uh, in jewelry shops in Israel. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess it was the, the um, what was, I'm thinking of, the Elat green or the, you know, you remember that, that minute? Even, even Elat is bluish. Bluish, okay. Finish. Greenish bluish. Was Green. very, very popular, very popular in jewelry, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s. We can still, it, it's not that popular these days, right? I don't, you don't see people wearing it now. But if you look at, you know, the, the, the jewelry box of, let's say, your, I don't know, for me, it would be my mother, my grandmother. I, Mom, do you have lapis lucid? You have, you have the green, green stones, green, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, lazurite. And this would be green quartz and amber. Amber is uh, 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 the, the fossilized resin of the saps of coniferous trees, uh, hues of yellow orange and jet or jade for the black and onyx and beryl uh, and rock crystal, which is just basically a quartz pure quartz, uh, shoham, which is pure quartz, yashve, uh, uh, sorry, which would be jasper. And do they have yahalom in here? Uh, yahalom, they translate as green quartz. Yahalom in modern Hebrew is diamond, a diamond. So I, we doubt that they actually put a diamond in there. Uh, I don't know exactly what the etymology, you know, how we get from the biblical Yahalom to the modern day diamond, that would be an interesting story. Well, what I'm saying is that, that I, I find this, this uh, exploration fascinating. Uh, and, and in a way it, it opens up all sorts of questions uh, as to, wow, where'd they get it? what they do? how they do it? What, how does the Torah know of this? And, and I guess it's obvious. It's obvious that, that you know, th there is a currency in precious gems and metals in antiquity. Um, you know, today is the, we, we just restarted the, the 929 project, which is the daily reading of a chapter of Tanakh. So today's chapter is chapter two of Genesis. In chapter two of Genesis, there's the description of the four rivers that come out of uh, Eden, um, or that water, you know, and, and uh, Eden in one river, uh, the uh, Sean, the <laughs> has a uh, lot of gold in it, and so here you have, of course, the idea that in the biblical area, of course, you know, people are aware of gold. Gold metallurgy goes back millennia prior to the Bible. Uh, you know, there's a reason why it's called the Iron Age in the Bible. Like for for the biblical era, is the Iron Age and the Bronze Age. Because it, you know, those ages are are identified by the the uh, prevalence of those metals or those alloys uh, at the time. So uh, while it may, you know, what we think that that to get to make metal requires, uh, you know, ex uh, extraordinary technology. It's not far fetched. You can you can look on YouTube and see how to make a primitive furnace and imagine that getting uh, uh, furnaces up to the temperatures that would smelt a very crude iron, iron ore, uh, would be not that difficult to do, to accomplish and to create iron uh, and to actually make a, a kind of steel. You know, it's, it's, these, are, these are layers of discovery that human beings made over the course of millennia that you simply, you add to basic ores you know, charcoal and other forms of carbon, and you get a kind of steel. And that technology was known already, you know, in, in, in the 
ten, tens of thousands of years ago. Um, so the same way, and I would say the same way that, that um, we are spellbound by precious stones and gems today, you know, such that if you were on a hike and you happen to, you know, stumble on, let's say, a, a, a mineral or a crystal or, or, or something that looked interesting, you know, and you had the tool available to you, you, you take your tool out. I just, I saw Bob and Carolyn there on un, unmute. Bob, where are you? Is he there? Bob and Carol, unmute. Okay, can you give me a geological uh, anecdote here on going and searching for things? You're a fossil look, but you, you have to unmute, Bob. I'm unmuted. No, other Bob, Bob Metz. Oh. <laughs> Not a medical question, a geology question. John, Bob Metz, <laughs> unmute. Yes, okay, can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Put your face in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm talking about geology. And what have you ever come across a mineral? Have you ever come, you know, like a what's your favorite? I mean, have you had a really exciting discovery? <laughs> <laughs> Minerals. <laughs> Well, not really you know, famous minerals, but you do, depending on which kind of rocks you look at. For example, like in, in Mount Arlington in New Jersey, there used to be a copper mine. Okay, know, perfect. For a long, long time. And I remember going on a field trip with other people that time. Of course, you had to be careful because when you step, sometimes you would fall through. But you could collect minerals uh, and so on. I remember being in Arizona when I went there and collecting things like malachite and chrysocola and lapis lazuli and, and things like that. It depends on what kind of rock you're looking at. Certain minerals, such as olivine, will only be in, say, metamorphic rock. Right. Uh, depending on which rock you're looking at, you'll find certain things. You look at other rocks, and you'll be able to find beautiful crystals, say, perhaps in sedimentary rocks, where they'll precipitate out in the geo. Or something like that. So I just want to ask you a quick question, which is how far back do people enjoy looking at gems? And, and you know, they're obviously it's obviously in the in the in the biblical era. They know of these things. They, they are aware of this. And is there any speculation that you have in terms of, you know, people and their fascination with minerals and gems and, and all that? Well, I'm certainly not a biblical scholar, but I would imagine it would go back an awfully long time, including the early parts of the Bible, where they certainly could come across some of these minerals and it would be quite fascinating to them. And that's why they're mentioned, for example, in the vestments, I would think. Definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bob. Steve Parkoff, you got your hand up. Go ahead. I'm muted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh... Just look at the uh, Egyptian <clears throat> pyramids. They go back to 3500 BC. Indeed. And they find a lot of jewels in those pyramids. King Tut's, uh was, was exceptional, and he's about 2500 BC. Okay. Perfect. So there were plenty of jewels around, and, and they used them. Uh, I believe they were also found in Babylonia, but I'm not sure exactly what they found there. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Lana, you had your... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I didn't have time to do it, but uh, I would like to know the connection between the colors of the stones to the tribes. Like uh, the first one, Odem, uh, was it Odem? Odem? Odem Is it connected to the Dudaim of Rouven? Um, well, I, I have no idea, and I'm sure I'm sure there's speculation. And I know Bob, you sent me a couple of links already. I'm sure there's there's ample speculation uh, from the myriad of sources that 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 tries to do that connection and 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 go at it. It's it's you know anybody's speculation here is as valid as the next person uh, because there 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 seems to be you know there it, these are these are symbols. So a symbol can have so many different layers of interpretation. Uh, I, I want to say at the simplest level, the, and what, we, what, what scientists would call, and we'll hear that in a second in, in, a, in a clip from a lecture, the Occam's razor, which is like the simplest explanation of a phenomenon is that what was this about? 
look, he wore, you know, he had, he had this on his chest and he was walking around representing it. Let, let me, let me take a, uh, for, for the sake of time, we're going to go into a couple of other, other areas here. Um, so, uh, I'm going to, uh, there are just three, three, um, quick, uh, articles. I'm just going to, uh, pick and choose from each one of them and close here. I put this up for my own sake for, for, uh, the uh, reference here, but, uh, I'll get them up here. Uh, this is, um, okay. So here we go. This is Marty Lukshin on the, uh, the ephod. Uh, the problem of the ephod is, it is but one of many questions related to these Torah portions that the Bible and rabbinic tradition leave inadequately explained. Although the Urim Vitturim are important items, we have no idea what they were. Sarna writes, it is clear that these two items constitute a device for determining the will of God in specific uh, matters that were beyond human ability to decide. While the function of this device is clear, the texts that relate to it do not carry a description of it or the technique employed in its use, the meaning of the two terms remains obscure. Urim Vitumim, we don't know. Again, classical rabbinic texts do not give us any clear picture of what the Urim and Tumim were. And again, we find a wide variety of explanations in the medieval Jewish commentaries. Rashi sees them as an object on which God's name was written. Lekach Tov, a contemporary Rashi, identifies the Urim and Tumim with 12 precious stones. After declaring that we do not know what the Urim and Tumim are, Ibn Ezra seems to suggest they were made of gold and silver. Is there anything else to say? And here, I, I'm, I'm quoting this as a kind of theme. Here, and indeed many important sections of the Torah, traditional Jewish interpretation lacks consensus. Many riddles are still left for the exegete, medieval, or modern. This survey offers two more important general warnings. If you hear that someone is studying how to prepare clothing according to halakhic tradition for the priests for a rebuilt temple, be suspicious. And be even more suspicious if someone tells you that the gates of interpretation are closed. And all we can do now is study the traditional and authoritative interpretation of the Torah. And here, I, I, I put that here as a kind of homiletical thing. It says, if anybody gets and says, you know, this is what the halacha says, then, you know, it's nonsense. It's complete and total nonsense. And if any of you say, you know, that you can't add interpretations because the canons of interpretation are closed, it's nonsense, okay? So I, I, those are important uh, ideas, just uh, as meta ideas. They, they are ideas above the actual details of this text, but they are part, they, they are what inform someone like me in my approach, which is to say, look, I don't know what these are. Nobody knew what they are. If anybody definitively claims that they know what they are, it's, it's just nonsense. And you, Elliot Malamut and Barry Chesler and, you know, you know, anyone here, you know, Jeremy, all my, you know, all the, Anybody who's interested in it, you have as much license to find uh, compelling interpretations for this as anyone. Okay, so now I'm going to go to another text, uh, which is um, um, the um, uh, this just quickly on this, uh, and then uh, we'll go to uh, a more thorough one. This is Baruch Schwartz, the high priest's role in the daily worship of God as ordained by P, which is the priestly author, then consists of the royal treatment of an appeal to the divine king in his earthly palace. I'll explain this. The high priest is the palace servant, and the garments that he wears are intended not merely to clothe him in dignity and adornment, the chavodu litifaret, but to accomplish one of the essential aims of worship, to call the king's attention to his subjects and their needs. Okay, so, so here we have a picture that the Kohen Gadol is a servant, and, and, you know, the idea, anthropomorphically speaking, God represented really in very human terms, and that the Kohen Gadol is the primary servant to God, and that the primary servant, as in all cultures and all royal systems, is you don't just come up to God, to, to your king, in, uh, in your daily clothes. You, you wear a sacred, you, you wear a special uh, set of clothing, in order to serve your 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 sovereign, and that was what the 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 the, the Kohen Gadol is doing. And I think on the very simplest level, uh, that's what's happening. I mean that you know we could we could have easily done uh, an entire 
exploration of the anthropology of uniforms and how uniforms uh, really disclose certain uh, status in society. Uh, they certainly, you know, if you are familiar with military insignia, you know that one stripe and two stripes and three stripes and one, you know, in Israel, there's, it's what, how do you say it? It's one clover, one echomrim, uh, the, the different things on the, on the, on the, on the epaulette of the, of a general. They're, they're. Oh, dargot, dargot. Yeah, the dargot. dargot. So what is it? The, the clusters on their, their leaf clusters or what's the word in Hebrew? Um, for for insignia, like a general is sh sh two of them, three of them, four of them. Seren, that, yeah. that's what you want. Seren, Seren, Rav Seren, Seren al right. Aluf, Rav Aluf. So the name for the thing, it's in 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 America. You have stars on your epaulets. Oh. You one, two, three, four stars. Like Darga, Darga is a level. Right, the level. So in, it's you know you have. Uh, uh, Four falafel balls or whatever it is—I don't know what it's called. You know, anyway. Falafel, right. yeah, yeah, that's right. Falafel. I think that's what it is. All right. And so there's an anthropology of of you know you people who who are attuned to this can see by the ribbons and by the the signia you know exactly what your status is. Okay. Um, and so uh, we we have that in all in all uh, cultures and all societies. All right. Let me let me now. Put in, but uh, when somebody in a certain tribe sinned, yes, one of the stones would start to light. Okay, so let me go into that now, and and uh, we we're gonna we're gonna explore uh, this. Uh, this is um, the uh, um, this this article was written by a very interesting guy. His name is Yol S. He's he's in the closet. He's a he's a Satmar Chassid who who dabbles in biblical criticism, okay? Uh, this is what he looks like, okay? He publishes anonymously, okay? He won't give you his picture, all right? But, but this is the <laughs> author. He's a Sutmer Chassid study in Shiva, which only tells you that, that don't think that that society, I've said this in my Tuesday class, don't think that that society is monolithic. There's a lot at the edges mm. and, and there are people who dabble in in all sorts of uh, uh, modern approaches to the Bible, even in uh, some of the most uh, 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 Hasidic, uh, ultra-Orthodox Haredi environments. Okay, so he has an article in which he he discusses this, um, and and I don't have the time to read the whole thing. So he he talks about this, and I'll give you uh, the the one one meaning: the holy names on parchment, the first few espoused by the Talmudists. Um, when the high priest consulted the Urim Tumim for divine advice on a particular matter, the letters on the stones, Yelani just said it, charged with the power of God's holy name, lit up and conveyed the answer. So the rabbis become very magical and legendary in their depiction of this, that it's almost like the, you know, I call this like the, the, um, the, uh, uh, you know, in the, on the star sh ship enterprise, you know, the, the modules that light up, you know, they, they communicate, okay? Uh, the high priest had to commingle the letters into a meaningful phrase, which formulated the solution to his quandary. According to another view in the Talmud, the letters actually jumped up and fused on their own. Okay. okay. Uh, another name for Choshen. So who, Maimonides, who eschewed the entire concept of the magical amulets. Uh, the Urim Tumim was another name for the stones of the breastplate, which were imparted divine messages without relying on a piece of parchment. Tribal boundaries that... that in a sense, what was on them or behind them in an envelope was the boundary. An astrolabe, this is Eben Ezra, mechanics of which are much a mystery. The Urim Tumim seems from his explanation, the Urim Tumim consisted of many pieces of expensive materials, some gold and silver, which were designed in a way that came to symbolize the universe that they, as they had conceived. Uh, Eben Ezra, an ardent astrologist, apparently believed that the Urim Tumim worked with astrological power. Okay, other medieval. So now finally, his, this is his point. In the past century, scholars have found a key to partially uncover the mystery of the Urim et Tumim. The story in the book of Samuel uh, relates a war that Saul led together with his son Jonathan against the Philistines. Saul forbade all the warriors from eating until the war was over. However, Jonathan was very weak and couldn't resist a taste of honey they found amidst the woods. 
Once Jonathan decried his father's injunction, the war suddenly turned in the Philistines' favor, and Israel suffered fatal losses, much to the horror of their leader. Saul decided to cast lots to see who was causing the divine wrath. He placed himself and his son on one side, of all of Israel on the other. He threw lots to see if God was angry at him and his son or at the rest of Israel. In his final preparations, he offered a prayer to God in, that in our text consists of two words. This awkward sentence is translated by medieval commentators as the prayer that the lots should be perfect and reliable. But when modern scholars studied this translation of the verse in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, they noticed that most of the sentence is missing in the Hebrew Bible. After a reconstruction based on the Septuagint, the text reads, in other words, the Septuagint, sorry, the, 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 the traditional text of the Tanakh eliminates this whole sentence. The Septuagint, the Greek translation, kept it. In the Passion of Prayer, Saul's upset that David, God did not give him an answer. If the fault is in me or in Jonathan, my son, O God of Israel, give Urim. And if the fault lies within your nation, Israel, give Tamim. Apparently, Urim designated fault or bad, based on the word Arur. And Tamim implied good, based on the word Tam. Saul wanted to see who was at fault. If Urim will be the result, then it's a sign that he or she, he or his son is guilty. If Tamim will be the result, the fault must rely within with someone else among the Israeli nation. So in other words, it was binary. The Urim Batumim could either reveal yes or no, or positive or negative, or innocent or guilty. Urim meant guilty, Tamim meant good, okay? In the light of the reconstructed text, one second Marlene, it seems plausible to surmise that when Saul asked advice from God, he employed the Urim Batumim, as in most other cases where the, the term by Yishal Belohim is used, the Urim Atumim worked by throwing lots, which were probably two stones or tablets inscribed with the words Urim Betumim, perhaps whichever fell out first or in proximity to the accused defined the result. Note, it seems that a def definite answer could not always be obtained from the Urim Betumim, as in our case where Saul complained that God did not respond to the first, the, the first time, so it seems likely that using the Urim Betumim is more complicated than throwing regular lots. The technique of throwing lots is hardly foreign to the biblical milieu. The Bible often employs lots to render decisions on difficult matters, such as to decide which goat should be sent to Azazel, and which one should be sacrificed to, for God on Yom Kippur, or to mete out the portions of the land to, this, to the uh, tribes of Israel. Although we can imagine that the priestly Urim Tumim ranked higher than regular lots, it is clear that results shown by every casting of lots were considered as divine messages. As the Bible explicitly say, we cast we may cast lots in our lap, but the Lord determines how they fall. In other words, and I'm just going to close the screen here. In other words, throwing a lot like Purim, you know, you know, even even today, to this very day, you know, when people play a lottery, they it's it's to chance, okay? But but they believe that something is dictating their chance. And so the lottery that is there is ascribed a divine origin. Thus, when they have a puzzle, that is, do we quit or go on? Are you guilty or not guilty? Should we do this or that? You know, it's, it's given to the, it's asked in a binary way, and whatever flashes out and whatever is decoded by the high priest is decoded as the oracle. And that way, it's it, it's a divine communication. Now you can imagine, of course, how this becomes problematic. Okay, and 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 it's not difficult to to see the problematic nature of oracular communication because all it takes is a way, you know, recircuiting of the board, and you can manipulate it to whatever you want. You know, anyone with a half a brain could figure out how to do this. Okay, so so. And, and that's why people like Maimonides just go off the rails on this. Marlene, you have your hand up. Is that like the Kruvim on the top of the uh, box that would uh, 
face away from each other or toward each other when the people were behaving and not behaving? So far be it for me to, to not accept the kind of connection. I think the, the, the possibility of connections to all of these symbols, I think is, 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 is what makes for rich interpretation. In fact, I'm gonna give you one in a moment, okay? You know, that's way off the rails here, but, but I, I figure I have the right to, to go off the rails uh, because uh, everybody else did, okay? And why not? Why, why not? I, 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 I'll, you know, my, my thing is that, that you know, there, there seems to be a correspondence or a, or a kind of antiphony between the Ark of the Covenant and the Urim and the Kohen Gadol. The Ark of the Covenant is the box in which the, the covenant resides, so that the box itself is representative of the covenant. Okay, well, the Kohen Gadol represents the, we've already established that he's the ambassador of the people. Okay, uh, but um, that, you know, to what extent is that conveyed by the different, the different gemstones? Well, you could say that the gemstones all have particular symbols and symbolic meanings of the different, uh, uh, that are associated with the different tribes. And why not? Let me, let me go on with, a, with just a couple of other things uh, and, and do this. Okay. All right. Um, I'm, this is this is my punchline. Okay. But 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 I'm going to anticipate this that that you know there there is a parallel and this is me talking the parallel between um, the what you do with the urim v'tumim and what you did with the uh, the tablets. Uh, so Aaron carries the names of the sons of Israel on his breastplate. These are the verses that I highlighted earlier. So you placed the the urim etumim inside the enveloped kind of you know carrying tunic, and and you placed that inside. Look at what it says about the Aaron. Aaron So in my simple interpretation, you have a parallel. I'm speculating here. There's a parallel between. Placing the gemstone array in his breast piece and placing the testimony inside the box. Okay, and that, if that's the case, the ark is the place where the covenant resides, and the urim et tumim is the people. But maybe there's more. Since there's no one reason, maybe we can invent or propose a reason: minerals and earth and life, and the coalition of minerals and life. And that, so what I'm going here is that minerals, okay, uh, I'm just going to share this one little, this line here. Um, rock and minerals are really the most robust storytellers. Uh, they preserve the record of history better than any other type of material that we have available. And so studying rocks and minerals tell us a great deal. This is Robert Hayes, and he's a... Uh, uh, he's not a cosmologist, he's a mineralogist, okay? He has a course uh, called The Origins of Earth. It's on the great courses. I, I, I uh, studied that course a couple of years ago, and he's got a wonderful book called The Story of Earth, which basically condenses his. I want to share with you just um, uh, a, a few uh, minutes of uh, this lecture he gave, okay? Uh, and I'm going to... Tonight I want to explore the story of our planet, the story of Earth. We live on a world of breathtaking beauty. From the vantage point of our nearby moon, we see that blue marble with the swirling white clouds. And we know when we see that, that this is a planet, a dynamic planet of change. And it's logical to ask, therefore, has it always looked like this? Has it changed? And if it's changed, how has it changed? How can we know the 4.5 billion history of our home? I come to this lecture as a mineralogist, and it turns out that rocks and minerals are really the most robust storytellers. They preserve the record of history better than any other type of material that we have available. And so studying the rocks and minerals tells us a great deal. Tonight, I'm going to talk about some of the work which has been sponsored by the Kuhn-Malchandis group and encrypt the yeah. story. Okay, it's using minerals as one of the guides to what we see. First, mineral evolution, which is looking at the change of Earth's minerals, the diversity and the distribution of minerals through deep time. 
And then mineral ecology, which is a way of looking at the distribution of Earth's minerals in a spatial dimension. All right, I'm going to fast Both forward a little bit. on Earth. So that's the, is, in ways we've never been able to do before. Okay. Now, why do we do this? Well, we certainly want to understand as mineralogists this the diversity and distribution of minerals on Earth. So that's kind of the, the mineralogist specialist perspective. But we also want to compare different planets and moons because we're learning more and more about the mineralogy of these other worlds. And we also want to understand the co-evolution of the rocks and minerals with life. And it turns out these are incredibly intertwined in ways that are still coming to life and really are astonishing. Okay, I'm going to stop there, okay, because it's, I don't want to go off the rails here. This is unbelievably fascinating material, unbelievably fascinating. And what he's saying here is that minerals and things that are represented by those stones, they actually tell a story. The story of minerals is the story of the universe. The story of minerals is the story of creation. The story of minerals actually is the story of life. The idea is, and he's pretty much you know, shown through, through his experiments, that it's called a, there's a co-evolution of uh, minerals on Earth and life. That is to say that without life, you don't get minerals, uh, certain kinds of minerals, all right? Because life on Earth produced oxygen and oxygen and uh, in the atmosphere helped to create, you know, the, there are about over 5,500 species of minerals. There are the mineral, you know, the, the and, and here again, I need, I need, I need some, some, some more help in the chemistry of this, but, but, the fact that we have a silicate, a silicate is a silicon and an oxygen. And the, you know, the fact that you would find oxygen molecules in these minerals means that the mineral has to exist after oxygen is produced and oxygen is produced when there is life on the planet. And all I'm saying here is, as we, we, we come to this point, is that there may be another another element, another kind of layer of symbolism. Look, uh, I as a as a as a regular person who who just you know enjoys a, a sunrise and a sunset and a mountain and a lake and a river and an ocean like everybody else. Okay, so my own reaction to seeing beautiful things or amazing things, whether they be you know anything, is like wonder and awe and just enjoyment and beauty and that these things represent uh, something beyond itself and th to me it, it's a, it's not a big leap to say that if you see a rock or you see a gem you're, you're going to say wow this is very beautiful this is this is part of the universe this is part of god's creation and so we have and, and if you go deeper into this, as he does in this lecture and the books and the research, is you see that minerals actually represent life. That there's a story written in the stone that he said, and I go back to that, that quote, which is story, uh, rocks are storytellers uh, and rocks freeze inside a certain history of the earth and they, they hold in them the narrative of the unfolding of creation, a creation that's continually evolving. And, and, and here I, I turn to Bob again, you know, that the, the earth, there are cycles of rocks, the rocks, I mean, it's billions of years, of course, hundreds of millions of years, but, but the minerals flow in and out of the earth's crust and tell you a story. And so what you have then on the breastplate of the breastpiece of the of the Kohen Gadol is not only the symbols of Israel, that would be the, the simple thing. You have on the other side the covenant, but hovering in this whole narrative, I think, and I, I'm making the case, is the universe. And so here's the story then. The story is God breaks through to a people, reveals the 
you know, the ten statement, the commandments, the covenant, the people preserve the covenant in its chest, in a sacred coffer, in a sacred box. Opposite this sacred box is an individual who at the same time represents the people of Israel in his ornaments and also gives a nod to the entire universe in the ornamentation on his body. And all of that is coming together in the sacred domain, such that when the Kohen Gadol comes, he's not only representing uh, B'nai Yisrael, in a way, he's representing the entire universe. And it's so interesting that the elements of the entire universe consist of, um, uh, you know, if you go back to chapter one of Genesis, so what are the major elements? The major elements on the first day, or the first and the second day, is uh, night and day, the things that God calls. God says, Vayikra la or yom v'lachoshech kara laila. God names one day and one night. And then uh, there is Vayikra uh, la rakia shamayim. He calls the, the rakia shamayim. And then he separates the waters from the land to the dry land, he calls Eretz. And then to the waters, he calls Yamin. So there are five elements there, the Yom, Laila, Shamayim, Eretz, and Yamin. And these are the only things that God actually, it, it says specifically, Vayikra Kara, that God names. Five elements, day, night, land, water and sky and then later on there's a sixth element and that's the human being Vaikra Adam he calls him man chapter 5 it's not part of the same creation story but it's a kind of uh, 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 it's a it's an uh, uh, appended that says that the other crucial element in the whole saga of creation is the human being yeah. okay so here we have it then that the narrative of the, the sanctuary is not only the specific Jewish narrative, the narrative of Israel and the covenant, I think, and I'm proposing here, that the narrative here is also uh, that this is the universe talking. The minerals, gemstones, based on just a, a surface analysis, surface examination, I would... I, I, I'm not sure that our ancestors would have had the deep knowledge of, you know, the species of mineralogy and the Earth's origins, but they may have had the intuitive knowledge that an olivine is different from a garnet, is different from a, uh, a, uh, a jade, is different from a jasper, is different from a, a quartz, is different from uh, a, a, an emerald, is different from a sapphire. They, they certainly saw these things, and they saw these things as symbols of a vast and beautiful world. And then I'm going to just give you one last thing here, and, and this will go into this, this. So you go on the internet and you go, what are the, what are the minerals and gemstones mean? And so here we, we come into more kind of, I don't know if this is new age or not, but, but each, each one is identified with certain kind of characteristics. And, you know, that's what you see when you go to gem stores, you'll see, you know, what they're associated with. And, and, Far be it for me to say that this is also not part, that this is not part of the narrative, that, that all of these different values are being represented here. Topa, health and wealth, garnet, sex, sexuality, emotion, emerald, tranquility, I mean, lapis lazuli, self-expression, I mean, all of these things represent uh, different kinds of, of qualities. And why not? Why not? Okay, let it, let it be that way. If, you, if we don't have the precise one-to-one -one equivalence, the sky is the limit. And for me, you know, I, I'm much more inclined to see that there's a narrative of creation going on here than anything else, but take your, take your pick. It's, it's all, you know, what you Okay, we go to, to Alana and then Bob, go ahead. Uh, I just want to mention that everybody has a birthstone according to <laughs> when they were born. I don't know why it was decided who is having what, but uh, probably it's, it's interesting. It's fascinating, and I, I and 
why not make that association? There, are, you know, all sorts of, you know, it's 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 very similar to astrology. You were born to a sign, a certain sign. Certainly, you know, astrology was very very popular in antiquity. Uh, we we saw Ibn Ezra was a very very profound astrologer, understood the world in these terms, and made those connections. Okay, Bob, go ahead, Bob, like. Yeah, <clears throat> three quick comments. At first, it seems, Rabbi, that you're calling for a geotheology or a theology Absolutely. of geotheology. I, I, which, I, I, I really, which really... I've actually, yeah. While you were talking, I was Googling, and actually in Europe and in Ireland, there are people who are, there's actually a, maybe even a journal that's beginning to look at the history of in stones and rocks and stuff. So that's Good. my first comment. Good. Uh, the, the, the second comment is... With regard to the gemstones and the colors, one of the things I read talked about how this could be connected to the different sins or characters of the different tribes. And for me, one of the associations I had, and I was curious your thoughts on this, during Yom Kippur and the al ceremony, when we're beating our hearts, to what degree are we recalling the gems and the clothing of the uh, Kohen Gadol in terms of thinking about the transformations that we need. So that was one of the associations I made is thinking about that. So nothing mystical here, right. but that piece. Okay. And then the third, the third comment I had is that this is a very multi-sensory experience that's being put out in all of this with the colors. And it reminded me of what you said last week in terms of Sinai and the seeing of sounds and stuff like that. So to what degree is this sort of multi-sensory experience of seeing these things, getting us to think, to feel, to smell, to hear across multiple senses, what they call synesthesia? So I'll take the third one first, which is I absolutely think that, that, that there is a lot of that going on here. The, the sanctuary is designed to, to evoke all sorts of different senses. N note, for example, you know, we haven't even gone into, you know, Ketoret incense, you know, that will figure very prominently once we get into the altar of incense and the incense offerings, etc. I mean, what's that about, it's, if not about, you know, uh, affecting senses? A person obviously is going to hear things, is going to see things, is going to touch things, is going to, uh, you know, engage with all senses in this environment. It's a sensory rich environment, for sure, for sure. Um, in terms of uh, the al I, I would just take it to the, a different place, which is atonement, that, that it's very clear within the system of the Mishkan and the temple in general, that the temple is functioning as an instrument for the atonement of the people in ways that we, I don't think, appreciate as much as our ancestors did. Uh, we, we, we don't have the notion of sin and forgiveness and judgment uh, as powerfully as they did. Um, you know, the, we, modernity broke with that. Uh, but, but religion is, is in a way, uh, trying to answer a question, which is, how do I stand before God uh, as a sinful human being? I, I require uh, a mechanism for atonement. Now, Christianity went in one direction with that, Judaism, of course, had its own origins with that. I don't know what directions uh, Islam takes, but in Judaism, biblical Judaism, atonement was had its instrumentality through this the, the rituals, the rituals of the temple. You you sinned, you brought a sacrifice, you sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice on the altar. The the, the high priest would effectuate your atonement, and so therefore. Another way of looking at this and looking at the breastplate, and, and some commentators do talk about this, and I find it compelling also, is that it's another instrumentality of atonement in ways that I don't know, I, I really don't understand. Um, but, but, you know, so I, what, what, what we're saying is that there are many, many different layers of interpretation here, one of which is that it's the symbolism of the people, one which is it's a symbol of atonement, that, and another which is, and I'm saying I'm going into a kind of, uh, a different universe here, which is that it's a symbol of of creation, and that's where I would go to the first thing you said, which is that that I think you know a good area, a creative area of theology, and this Robert Hazen kind of in the lecture he kind of you know lights on it, but he says, look, you know, okay, so so 
you know, the Bible talks about the, you know, gives you a picture of the world, but, but it, it, it's, you know, the, the idea that, that the world doesn't come out as an accident. It's a very, very powerful theological idea that, that existence is not an accident. That idea is a biblical idea. And he's saying as a scientist, you know, I, I'm drawn to the narrative that, that it, it's, it's, he's not calling it intelligent design, but he's calling it, he's basically saying, look, the kinds of things that, that happen, uh, they can't be duplicated in the experimental setting. And so we therefore have no explanation. And so therefore we, we have to say, look, they, ha they have to come out of somewhere. Okay. All right. Uh, John, go ahead. Where'd you go? So two, two things. Uh, when you were talking about the effect of modernity and the loss of magic, I think Max Weber had a great term. He called it disenchantment. Yeah. And it was, uh, this is what, this was the effect of modernity. And the other thing is, I think this is a fabulous class because when I read these things, it was so tedious. It was awful, boring <laughs> stuff. And you really made it, you know, meaningful. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You know, that, it's a great, I, I'm very, very happy yeah. about that. It's, it's, I, 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 I the book, you know, I've been, I've been um, carrying around these ideas for a long time. And whenever I get to these parsh, Parshas, you know, I think about like, so the same questions that everybody has, which like, where did you get, where do we get this stuff? How do we get this? And what does it mean? And all that stuff. And how come it doesn't, how come we don't understand what it means? And the reason we don't understand what it means is because we don't have the vocabulary. We don't have the shared world, you know, in our world, you know, we have a totally different set of symbols and set of, uh, okay, but, but what, what we're trying to find here is the commonality and, and what the, the human connection between people like us who live several thousand years after these items, and ask, you know, how, what, what stimulates our own imagination, you know, and what stimulates the response of beauty and wonder. You could go to Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue and be spellbound by the jewelry that there that is there, and you could you could be amazed at the um, you know creativity that 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 is necessary to make them. You could also be you could also take the story, which is they got they found a diamond. <laughs> And they took the diamond and they cut the diamond and they polished the diamond. And then, and you can ask the question, and where did the diamond come from? And so what Robert Hazen in that, in the lecture uh, says is that the oldest mineral in existence is the diamond. The diamond is the first mineral that come, that emerges. Why? Because, you know, after the, after, you know, the, 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 after the Big Bang, the, 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 the universe is hundreds of thousands of degrees. And this is the, the thing that has the highest melting point. Uh, and so it's carbon, it's pure carbon. And it's pure carbon that's condensing. And all the stuff that, that we have uh, aggregates because of, of the dust of stars and the fusion of gravity, etc., etc., etc. And that's a diamond. So we have an instinctive, visceral reaction to diamond that's deeply, deeply embedded in the human psyche, and and I think it's all it's all connected. It's all it's all related. It's all related. All right. With that, Rabbi, go ahead, Steve. Final word. Just for information, I just looked up the origin of birthstones. Okay. And and there's a reference here that Josephus says birthstones came from the breastplate of Aaron. There you go. So the stones on the breastplate are not only the tribes of Israel, they're the months of the year. Of there course, there's another, you, there's another one <laughs> yeah. that, that they oh, represent the, the months of the Zodiac. Yeah. Okay. And actually birthstones weren't used until the 15th century or weren't referred to as such. So there's two minor points to very good answer as, Alana's as question. plausible as anything when we don't know the answer we we have anything is possible all right I, Go I ahead, I that my, my house is full of uh, pictures and of, of of birthstones oh lovely 
Being born from Israel, every visit, another thing with Israel. all the birthstones. Oh. Okay. Marlene, show us what you have there. Yes, those of you who went to Israel starting in 